so Dan, why are you wearing what looks to all intents and purposes like a an offensive hobo costume? Because it is fucking cold in my basement. <laughs> So, um, I, I'm fortunate. Anyway, so, my, my basement is cave like, but it hovers at about 62, 63. So <laughs> it's not bad. I can actually wear a jacket and not be too, uh, too bothered by it. But, uh, yeah. Um, so today we're reading, uh, Cave Hic Dragonus, a critique of regime analysis by Susan Strange. It's the sort of reflection critique part of the International Regimes volume. So if you know your edited volumes, you know your edited issues, there's often somebody who's invited to write a conclusion that maybe summarizes, maybe critiques, maybe does something, and that's what this essay is to the other arguments on international regimes. Uh, so Patrick, you did a little bit of prep, so you want to tell us a little bit about Susan Strange? Sure, sure. I'll start just with a little anecdote of this piece in particular. Uh, after this piece was published, this piece becomes somewhat legendary among IR scholars. And uh, I have many times in the course of my career, I'm sure many of our listeners who are also uh, international studies scholars have heard uh, people say this as well, that they're writing a response to something and they're going to do a Susan Strange. And everybody knows exactly what you mean. You mean this piece, you mean this particular response to this edited volume because it became uh, somewhat uh, celebrated, uh, quite well, re well renowned, uh, the, the particular kind of uh, sharpness that, uh, that the Strange brought to this particular analysis. So Susan Strange is someone who, unusually for the way academia tends to work, especially nowadays, is someone who never had a PhD. She earned a first in economics at the London School of Economics back in 1943, and then she spent 20 years before being in academia as a financial journalist. And she worked for The Economist and The Observer. And then she moved into academia and really moved into academia, becoming the Burton Professor of International Relations at LSE in 1978. Uh, and then she ended up uh, serving as an uh, academic at the e at European University Institute, etc. She was the third female president of the International Studies Association from 1995 to 1996. And a couple of the folks who were talking about her impact on the field of international studies, parenthetically, she was always a partisan of international studies rather than international relations, which she regarded as a much narrower focus on sort of, you know, formal ties between states. She was really big on international studies as a big, broad, ecumenical church. Uh, that when people talking about her impact on the field, uh, one of the, the things that I see repeatedly is people talk about her as almost single-handedly establishing international political economy as a field, at least in Britain, as someone who is tremendously influential with carving out a space for that kind of study of the intersection of politics and economics, which is also the title of one of her more celebrated and famous books, Politics and, uh, politics and, Economic, politics and Markets, actually. So um, someone who definitely had a, a huge impact on things. The book of hers that I first read years ago is a book called Casino Capitalism, which I thought was a really insightful treatment of what had happened to deregulated financial markets and the ways that they operated that were very different from standard kind of models of, of economic rationality. Strange was never a big fan of, uh, of extremely detailed formal models. Her version of political economy is much more historical and much more empirical than it is kind of theoretical and spare. So. So now that you've told us a bit about uh, Susan Strange, are you going to tell us a bit about what whiskey you are drinking today? Yes, yes. Uh, I, uh, I don't actually have a bottle of what I really wanted for this. So I was up looking at my whiskey cabinet earlier, trying to see what I had kind of in the back. I thought I had a bottle of Lagavulin 12. And the reason I wanted Lagavulin 12 is that unlike Lagavulin 16, which is you know a nice PD complex whiskey, uh, it's Lagavulin 12 is a much saltier, much sharper expression of the same thing. And I thought sharp and salty were pretty good ways to describe certainly the tone that Strange takes in this piece and that she takes in a number of her, her writings. Um, she gives off the impression in a lot of the things she writes of just someone who doesn't really take any bullshit. And that is sort of the style that she has. So I was looking for a bottle of Log 12. I could not find a bottle of Log of 12. I decided not to open my, my bicentennial celebration bottle Log of 8 because I've never actually tasted that. I don't really know what it tastes like, so I want to save that for a different occasion. So I did something different. What I got instead is I got a bottle 
of Blair Athol, Blair Athol 12. And the thing about Blair Athol is it, most of the production from Blair Athol gets mixed into other things. So you very rarely find just the straight single expression of this. And so it's sort of the, the distilled pure thing that underlies a lot of other whiskeys. And I think in some ways it's a nice example of what we see with this piece of Susan Strange's. It really kind of brings together a whole series of criticisms, which are, as I think we'll talk about, strangely contemporary criticisms. So they're, but they're all here in kind of pure form in a lot of ways. So it's like, Everything else has a slight blend to it. This is the pure stuff. So I'm going to drink a little bit of the pure stuff. I'm just having a Lagavulin 16 as my ah. substitute, which actually uh, is interesting. really good. It's interesting that we both went for Lago, where originally our brains went to Lagavulin for this. Well, I, I'm just rotating between the few open whiskeys that I have. So, Hey, um, but Log 16 is good stuff. And I have some of that upstairs, but I figured that... Uh, once I saw the Blair Athol next to it, I was like, oh, no, this is what I'll do. So, wow, I need another trip to Scotland. I'm running out of this stuff. So as you were saying about the, uh, oh, well, how, should we cheers? We, we should. Cheers. Slunch. Hmm. So I think we should just work through it. I mean, would you... Do you want to take a go at summarizing her argument, or, or should I do that? Well, it's hard to, to summarize. I mean, she has a whole series of very trenchant critiques of the entire regime research agenda, some of which are about the theoretical ambitions of regime theory, some of which are about the methodology that people utilize, some of which are about the substantive insights that she feels are not appropriately conserved in, in regime theory, uh, largely insights having to do with the relative power of states and things. Uh, so she really covers a, a lot of ground in a very short time. Um, and in doing so, I think she, she uh, is there a cat in the background? Are you hearing uh, I'm plaintive hearing, meows from my I'm side? Hearing, I'm hearing plaintive meows. There could be any number of cats in the background. It's possible that uh, Kibbeth or somebody wants to visit me and is perplexed by the green screen. Uh, it's possible that you're just hearing stuff coming from upstairs. I don't know whether Maya's fed the cats yet. If she hasn't, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is all about the food. Uh, That's so okay. I've, I, I don't know, right? There are cats running around. We have four cats in this uh, article has five dragons yes or five warnings in it we might as well just read those mm -hmm. so uh this is on page 479 it's the second paragraph she says the five counts or dragons to watch out for are first that the study of regimes is for the most part a fad one of those shifts of fashion not too difficult to explain as a temporary reaction to events in the real world uh, but in itself making little in the way of a long-term contribution to knowledge. So that's like our first question, right? Is this, is that right? You know, um, and I, I think regime stuff didn't go away, uh, but we can come back to that. Uh, second, it is imprecise and woolly. Okay, that I think we're probably going to wind up agreeing with. Um, third, it is value-based, as dangerous as loaded dice. Sorry, fourth, it distorts by overemphasizing the static and underemphasizing the dynamic element of change in world politics. And fifth, it is narrow-minded, rooted in a state-centric paradigm that limits vision that limits vision of a wider reality. Then she says there are two indirect criticisms. Uh, uh, follow from these five points. One is that it leads to a study of world politics that deals predominantly with the status quo, tends to exclude hidden agendas and to leave unheard or unheeded complaints, whether they come from the un underprivileged, the disenfranchised, or the unborn, about the way the system works. In short, it ignores the vast area of non-regimes that lies beyond the ken of international bureaucracies in diplomatic bargaining. The other is that it persists in looking for an all-pervasive pattern of political behavior in world politics, a general theory in quotation marks, that will provide a nice, neat, and above all, simple explanation of the past, an easy means to predict the future. So I'm going to predict that you like that last criticism. I'm a huge fan of that last criticism. I don't think she's entirely correct that that is what all of the people in the volume are attempting to do, but I think she's quite insightful in picking up on that, what for lack of a better word, you could call a kind of American neo-positivist style of, of articulating theory, which 
runs through the volume as a whole. And we talked about Ruggie's piece last time. And even though Ruggie's piece tries to distance itself from that a little bit, the conceptual categories that he's operating with are still categories that are wrapped up with notions of general covering laws and thus some general notion of theory rather than a notion of specific explanation. So I think that Strange is correct in the way that someone who is coming at the American IR community as an insider outsider can see that perhaps people inside the discussion can't necessarily see that there is this kind of lurking theoretical ambition there. And strange, I, I read the read that line in particular or those lines that I sort of think of Hedley Bull and I think of the criticism of this American generalizing theorizing style um, and that I think that's correct. I think she's picked up on on something that is at least implicit, if not explicit, in a lot of these kinds of American theoretical attempts. Okay, so let's talk about the first critique, the idea that this is a fad. And as I've already suggested, if it was a fad, it didn't completely go out of fashion because there is still work on regime, regime theory and regimes. In fact, uh, what we call regime complexity right now is a big deal. The idea that Regime, you don't have single regimes, but you have overlapping in multiple sites of regimes that even govern some of the same spaces, and that may, for example, increase the running room for states to pick and choose what aspects of global governments they want to tap into to resolve their disputes or get what they want. Uh, but she does say that this is a fad, and she has some very specific reasons for believing it's a fad. But before we get there, she has an interesting comment about the difference between American IR in the late 70s, early 80s, and European IR. And I know that that's something you, you want to talk about. Uh, yes. Which specific line were you thinking of here? Well, I was There's thinking about so uh, 41. She mm -hmm. says, perhaps Europeans are not generalist enough. Perhaps having picked a field to work in, they are inclined to stick to it too rigidly. Uh, this is her saying that if you are to ask Europeans to write this volume, you get like a normative piece and you get a piece on European politics, you get a piece on historical interpretation, all mm -hmm. that stuff. But she says, then perhaps Americans are more subject to fads and fashions in academic inquiry than Europeans, more apt to conform and join in behind the trendsetters of the times. Yes, and right before that, we have one of my, my favorite lines in, in the entire article, uh, which is she puts in as a parenthetical, but I think it's a really important quip. Europeans generally, I would venture to say, are more serious in the attention they pay to historical evidence and more sensitive to the possibilities of divergent interpretation of quote-unquote facts. So, again, what we have here is a very... And I, I hesitate in using the kind of national language for this, but, but bear with me for a second. There's a distinctively English or British sensibility to what Strange is saying. And I mean that not in the sense that somehow anybody born in a particular island is going to end up having certain theoretical sensibilities, but in the way that we talk about the English school as being a kind of loose cluster of approaches to thinking about international affairs that emphasizes uh, historical complexity and the way that, that arrangements of international uh, affairs are, are produced contingently and, and a, a general disregard or a dismissal of, of these generalizing kinds of theoretical notions. Less of a running around looking for the magic key that will allow us to unlock the theoretical insight that sort of solves everything in world politics and more of a more of a, a historicist resignation to the complexity and the the non-utopian character of politics. Not quite as much as like a German realpolitik tradition would have, but certainly there's something there, a thread that you can see in Strange. You can see it in Headley Bull. You can see it in a lot of the English school authors. You can see it coming through in something like Barry Buzan's work. So there is certainly some kind of at least family resemblance uh, or the rejection of, of, of the idea that there's a final theoretical answer. And Strange, I think, is correct that a lot of the story of the of American IR can be told in terms of people converging on or chasing after one or another master narrative, master key that would allow them to put all of the various kinds of, of theoretical formulations uh, in in some kind of seamless whole. So that that urge to find the final answer 
to these things, which at least in Strange's account, we don't see as much in Europe in part because she says the European sort of subfields are a little bit more divorced from each other. But also I would argue in part because the kind of historicist sensibility that she and other English school authors operate with, the, while it doesn't proclaim itself as the final theoretical answer to things, it seems to tacitly say, because we have this experience, that is our substitute for the final theoretical answer to things. We have lots of worldly experience in doing these things and actually seeing how practical politics is put together. And I think also the other thing that sort of indicates to me, remember that Strange comes at academia as a second career after having been a financial journalist who'd been working in the world of practical financial politics and governance for 20 years before she ever came back into academia. Um, and so there's a kind of dismissal of the armchair theorizing, you know, well, let's not, let's not worry about that. Let's not worry about, about what the, the latest thing is that's going to allow us to, uh, to, to answer all these questions. The final other piece of context to this is she's writing this in, in the early 80s. So this is still in the shadow of what is sometimes called the second great debate which is understood in the field of international studies as being a debate between the traditionalists and the scientizers, with the scientizers basically all being Americans. The idea that some new technique, whether it's a quantitative technique or a computer assisted technique or whatever, will allow us to resolve some of these perennial problems of the analysis of politics by bringing some sort of newfangled gadget to bear on it. And a lot of the English school pushback against that was no, you're not going to solve politics with some new thing. So in the temporality that she's signaling in there, I kind of hear echoes of that same kind of, of England versus American international studies second great debate. Yeah, and she she even says at one point that some of what's happening in American IP and American IR is attributable to more powerful computing and the better ability to do quantitative work and all that kind of stuff. What I found interesting here in particular, though, is her diagnosis of why regime theory is a fad, right? Because the, the underlying argument here is really that uh, American IR has always sort of chased the chase the needs of American policy, right, in this in the sort of zeitgeist of the immediate moment. So she says, you know, when when the United States cared a lot about European integration as a way of having a junior partner, all of a sudden you get the study of integration and functionalist theories and neo-functionalist theories of integration. And those become a big deal. Uh, she says the current fashion for regimes is a reaction to the sense of American uh, decline. We talked a little bit about this last time with Ruggie, but you know the sense that things are falling apart, the United States is no longer as powerful as it was, they can't order international politics, uh, that the United States is in a kind of post-Carter malaise, all that kind of stuff. And I think her answer to that is interesting in its own right. But before we get to that, I actually wanted to ask you, do you think her diagnosis of the difference between Americans and Europeans is still true? The most interesting thing I think that's happened in American IR in the time since Strange wrote this particular diagnosis is simply that it's a lot bigger than it was back then. And because there is more people doing things clustered around, yes, international relations, the subfield of US political science, but a whole series of other things in international studies, that you have, you have a much broader and more diffuse universe for these things. So it's been a while since we had a, a field wide fad that everybody is grabbing onto. Instead, you have little movements of this group and this group and this group. Uh, you know, sometimes they're called turns now. I think that's the the, the phrase that people like the, the this turn and the that turn and so on and so forth, uh, which there was, a, there was a piece that actually was just published in International Theory, which is brilliant on this, which points out that the sociology of calling something a turn is that it purports to make claims that it's going to take over and rattle, rattle the entire mainstream of the field, but really its targets are other critical voices. And the mainstream just kind of keeps on doing its own thing. And it seems to me that the to the extent that you could talk about an American mainstream, it's not an American mainstream that is 
lurching after the next fad except for particular kinds of technical innovations. And so you have a succession of different kinds of technical computations of essentially rationalist bargaining analyses as kind of your basic set of, of what it is that people are doing uh, in some of these journals. But uh, there's so much other stuff going on now in, in English speaking IR, Anglophone IR, which is not just Ang Anglophone International Studies, is not just sort of constrained to American IR. And that's, I think, happened over the last 20 or 30 years. And the idea, though, that is that the flip side of the strange diagnosis, that the Europeans are less prone to fads. Um, I don't know. I think there are certain parts of European IR that you could, uh, with cause, refer to somewhat unkindly, but not entirely inaccurately, as uh, obscure continental theorist of the month. And now we're going to use insights from some particular person who no one in the field has ever heard of. And then we're going to have somebody else that comes along a few months later, a few years later. I mean, there's been a, a succession of those kinds of things. And I think if we use Strange's criteria for that, we could say there's a certain amount of faddishness in which kind of theoretical language people are translating their claims into. Um, so I don't think it's it's the case that that no IR, no study of international affairs outside of the United States is subject to fads. Um, but it is, I think the story is more complicated than, than Strange makes it out to be here in, in 1982. I suspect to the extent that it was correct in 1982, it had a lot to do with the relatively small size of the field. American yeah, IR I mean, I, was I, a smaller place. Yeah. So I'll say, I think that's right. I think that European IR is more diverse but in some ways more faddish when it comes to theoretical trends. While the United States is uh, more homogenous and doesn't really have much in the way of big theoretical trends anymore, uh, but in some degree, as a result, is less likely to be faddish. I mean, I think that if you wanted to talk about, about things that might be fads in the United States, you'd be talking about things like the, be sort of the take up of behavioral economics. Right, or you would talk about something like uh, field experiments, which is the big thing that was a debate now. Have field experiments peaked? Have, have field experiments peaked? Have they not peaked? Those are the, and as you said, they're sort of, if you think about them, they're kind of tech fads, right? Or, or methodological fads rather than theoretical ones, or they're not social theory that's and, causing yes. changes. No, I think that's exactly right. And when, when, when you were asking the question about, about fads in the US, the, the two things that leapt to mind were field experiments and quote unquote mixed methods. And the idea that sort of any argument is enhanced by throwing in a quant chapter or some interviews. And that kind of, of methodological trend, I think you see on a fairly regular basis within, uh, within US political science, USIR. Um, but whether that is better or worse than than a cycle through different social theorists in whose particular idiosyncratic language, into whose particular idiosyncratic language we have to translate our existing claims in order to make them seem valid. I'm not sure which of those two is more or less healthy. I think you can see some elements of that going on, just the way that sort of academic debate generally works, uh, that you, there's a certain amount of there's a certain amount of retranslation work that is always going on in social science fields. I mean, I'm, again, I'm, as, as, I, as I'm sure everybody listening to this podcast knows, I'm a huge fan of Andrew Abbott's account of the way disciplines uh, proceed by fractalization. So they fragment, but then there's an argument and then the victorious side remaps other claims into their own preferred terminology and methodology. And I think you can see that kind of thing going on. But it is fascinating that the debates in the United States do this more on methodology than they do on social theory. And a lot of the European or a lot of the non-US centered Anglophone debates tend to do this more in terms of social theory than they do in terms of methodology. The other, the other argument she's got going on about faddishness, right, is this argument about chasing the latest developments, right? I, I describe this, I think, as the, uh, the sort of immediate zeitgeist uh, and particularly subject to American policy whims. And here, I think, again, it's a situation where I would say that that happens about equally in both the United States and Europe now, although some of the issues might be different, 
Right. Um, so if you think about the big American empire debate and the explosion of empire work we had in the early 2000s to mid 2000s, that was equally Europeans writing as it was uh, Americans writing. If you think and she does have some interesting claims here. She talks about how this is, I mean, essentially she's arguing that this is in some respects the end of American informal empire uh, and that Americans are, because they're not willing to confront the imperial character of uh, U.S. power uh, prior to the late 1970s, this looks for them like a really radical break uh, in a way that they're having trouble processing. Uh, she also makes what I found a, a pretty interesting argument. It's an argument that's consistent with her other work, and it's an argument that's really apropos right now, which is that Americans are, you know, she says Americans are looking out in the world and they're feeling like they have less influence. M markets are doing their thing. Uh, other kind, there's uh, there are other actors who are who are shaping the regulatory environment, all that sort of stuff. She will, she does say that Americans are get are sort of over freaking out about this, right? That there are still real resources of American power, but she also says that these are actually policy choices. What Americans think is a function of U.S. decline in terms of U.S. influence in the world is really a function of the onset of what we would now call neoliberalism. And so as the United States has backed off of markets, uh, you know, sort of backed off of, of tight control over a variety of, of, of market and transactional spheres, uh, and those things have kind of gone and done their own thing, the United States' is, American actors have then looked at the effects and said, you know, this is a decline of U.S. power when it didn't have to be, and arguably it doesn't have to be. So this is Reaganism and Thatcherism reducing the power, the seeming power of the state uh, as a more general phenomenon, not necessarily uh, a decline in U.S. Uh, hegemony per se. Uh, and there's also then a kind of subject here that, that U.S. hegemony as a sort of state-centered hegemony is in decline through those policy choices. But as she's going to argue later, there's lots of other forms of what we would call hegemony and hegemonic ordering going on at the subnational and the transnational level where the units are not states, they're firms or their regulatory agencies, their sub-state agencies, or their transnational actors, uh, non-market transnational actors of various sorts. And I found that really interesting. I think that's really kind of very similar to some of the debates we have now. Do you have any reactions to it? Well, I, I thought her, her particular insight that uh, cosmopolitan American academics have a hard time acknowledging that the US-led international order is really a form of non-territorial imperialism. And because we don't narrate it in those terms, we don't quite understand some of these dynamics. Uh, that and the claim from this article, one of the, from this article from many years later, like the thing is that stick with me, the word woolly always stuck with me and I'm sure we'll talk about that next. Um, but, and that, that parenthetical that I had that I read earlier, but also this idea that, and this is a point that you see repeated over and over again in a lot of Strange's work, to the extent that markets have become more powerful than state regulators. That is the result of deliberate choices by state regulators. That the advancing of unregulated markets, the ways in which the financials, global financial system is no longer specifically under the control of a particular state, Strange argues, and I think she's correct, that's because there have been deliberate decisions made by states and state leaders to allow markets to flourish in that way. And so the supposed decline of American hegemony, in this case, she suggests, and I think she's correct, is actually an expression of American hegemony, that yeah, the United is. States could actually make those decisions to allow those markets to do those things. On 43, she just says this wonderful passage. She writes, if the authority of the United States appears to have weakened, it is largely because the markets and their operators have been given freedom and license by the same state to profit from an integrated world economy. If Frankenstein's monster is feared to be out of control, that looks to non-Americans more like a proof of Frankenstein's power to create such a monster in the first place. The change in the balance of public and private power still leaves the United States as an undisputed hegemon of the system. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we would make exactly the same claim now. I think that you would have to really talk much more about, say, Chinese market power and regulatory authority and things like that. But I think, we, we, I think that this is still, uh, to a large degree, true. Right, that um, that uh, American hegemony persists 
more in this diffuse form. Uh, but even if the sort of hegemonic order itself is under siege and unraveling, and even the United States as a state is getting less of what it wants. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is the whole kind of self-inflicted wound stuff. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, uh, and uh, where decline existed as a falling off in the country's power and will to intervene with world market mechanisms from euro dollar lending to the grain trade rather than significant change in the distribution of military or economic power to the favor of other states. Such changes that, as there is has been more internal, international. As I said, I think that's more complicated now because economic power really has diffused uh, in ways that it hadn't quite so much at the time. And, and also special props to her for properly using the notion of Frankenstein's monster versus Frankenstein. So she actually gets that illusion right, which is great. Um, but this idea that, that we're really talking here and she's not it's not surprising to me that she's not especially conceptually explicit about this, but in a way, I think she's saying there's really two different definitions of hegemony going on here. There's the state version of hegemony, which is the thing that the, in her view, the American scholars are focusing on, the relative decline of US power and the ability of the state to sort of command various things. But then there's this broader notion of hegemony, which is certainly not orthodox Gramscian Marxist, but is more akin to that kind of notion of hegemony. Puts me more in mind of something like uh, like Stephen Gill's argument about American hegemony without without America. Uh, the idea that that these are really sets of unequal relations that are encoded at various levels, and they don't necessarily need to have a core from which power operates. It's more of a, a system that privileges certain things rather than others, which get, becomes the argument that she makes a big deal of later, which I also think is, is quite correct, which is the privileged position of the dollar still in a system of floating currencies and, and floating exchange rates. Uh, the, the privileged position of the dollar still, at least in 1982, is evidence of the inordinate power that the US has in the system. Arguably, that's another thing that's changed now that the dollar is no longer quite as the indis indisputed, the champion of, of reserve currencies around the world as it was back in, in the early 1980s, certainly. But that claim that, that we really need a bigger, less state-centric understanding of hegemony in order to make sense out of these changes going on in international affairs, that seems to be the claim that's at work here. And I think even though some of the details are a bit different, I think the claim is absolutely correct and incredibly insightful for 1982. And interesting irony, is her argument here really all that different than Ruggie's argument at the end of the piece about where the threats to the embedded liberal order would come from? Because Ruggie suggested, as we talked about last time, that the biggest threat was the rise of different kinds of values about state market relations, the sort of thing that we eventually would call neoliberalism in the Washington Consensus. And Strange seems to be pointing to exactly the same thing as being where the change would come from. So She thinks it's much more advanced than he does. Exactly. And I think she's right. I agree. That's I one agree. of the things we talked about last time. We think Ruggie is way too, for somebody who likes embedded, embedded liberalism, he is way too sanguine about what's happening. And we, we know that we have hindsight is twenty twenty, but she seems to be more on the ball here. You know, it's interesting. I was trying to kind of work around how to reconcile what I think is right about her argument with what I've been arguing about hegemony, right? And you know, obviously, the arguments about what I think about dollar hegemony, it's still a massive strategic resource for the United States to exploit, but it is not necessarily, it's a lagging indicator. It's the kind of thing that is, is erodible. And if the United States doesn't play its cards right, will be eroded faster rather than more, rather than more gradually. But I do think this idea about kind of diffusion of neoliberalism, what we would now call neoliberalism, diffusion of a kind of American style of economic management, the Frankenstein's monster that the United States has unleashed on the globe, that's still very, very much around. And if you look at, for example, what's happening to liberal order right now, it's not that, uh, it's not that we're losing kind of capital mobility or, or it's not that we're seeing, we might because of COVID-19, but it doesn't look like we're seeing major reversals on trade. I mean, mm -hmm. Trump is in, you know, Trump's done some protectionism, but ultimately what he seems to do when is renegotiate some small deals in minor ways. And so there's the net effect on the trading regime isn't that great. The most important thing he's done, of course, is to, is to neuter the WTO, 
right? So he's made, you know, she talks about the advantages of bilateralism here, right? He's made bilateral ways of, of dealing with, with trade disputes much more important. Uh, and, you know, he's relied on, on sort of coercive instruments more than uh, adjudicative ones. Uh, nonetheless, I think that she's, she's really right here. Uh, and, and if you do look at sort of contemporary liberal order, uh, political liberalism is where you have the problem. Right, that's where China, Russia, other actors are really pushing back on the United States and Europe. But economic liberalism, neoliberalism is kind of doing pretty well. And it's doing well for the reason, because it's, as she says, it's sort of been unleashed and now it's encoded much more broadly, a kind of uh, American hegemony of a kind without uh, American or US hegemony. I, I thought I was exactly thinking like you were of Gill and of Stephen Gill in particular about this. She also makes some interesting arguments about international organizations. And that's her second claim, where she says that people are also freaking about in, about it. People are also freaking about freaking out about international organizations. And to some degree, regime theory is an attempt to deal with that. Um, and she has this interesting move she makes where she says that there are three different purposes of international organizations. She says there's a strategic purpose, which is that international organizations are tools of power politics. And so the United States uses the Security Council to authorize some venture or China wields veto there. Or the United States uses the IMF to launder assistance and provide quick economic assistance to, the, to Ukraine, right, after a crisis or something like that. There's adaptive, right, so they, they sort of she says, providing the necessary multilateral agreement or whatever arrangements are necessary to allow states to enjoy the political luxury of national autonomy without sacrificing the economic dividends of world markets and production structures, which is a, I don't fully get what she's arguing here, but I understand it roughly as the paradox of sovereignty, right? That states uh, make decisions in international organizations to concede some of their sovereignty, but because they're making those decisions, they're still exercising their sovereign autonomy to some degree, and they still look sovereign and autonomous, and they can still claim to be sovereign and autonomous. The reverse side of that paradox, of course, is that you need these multilateral organizations to protect sovereignty, because if they're not there, you just kind of get rapacious power politics, uh, and nobody, in, you get empire and other types of things. So I think that's kind of what she's talking about there. And then she says the symbolic, which is allowing everyone to declare themselves in favor of truth, beauty, goodness, and world community while leaving governments free to pursue national self-interest and do exactly as they wish, what Krasner would later kind of call organized hypocrisy, following Niels Brunson, uh, you know, or what, you know, the sort of way in which we can continue to affirm values in international organizations through the UN Charter and other sorts of things, even if we violate them. And we know, of course, that the UN Human Rights Council is full of human rights violators that are, to some degree, both kind of reducing the human rights, um, the scope of human rights protections, but are also affirming them by, that they're important by the very fact that they're there right, and serving on the council. And I, which the reason why this distinction is kind of interesting, because I think obviously it captures a lot of the different ways now that people look at international organizations. So you have a kind of tradition of looking at them strategically in terms of, uh, you know, their, their use, their instrumental use, you have this ad adaptive sense in which the emphasis is on bargaining, I think, within uh, international organizations in the symbolic sense, which we might associate with constructivism or whatever, even though she's fairly dismissive of <laughs> the practical or the, the, the broader, imp you know, she thinks the symbolic thing is impor important. It obviously matters, but she doesn't think it really has, when push comes to shove, much effect on world politics. But her argument here is that Americans are kind of freaking out because these things have been decoupled. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you look at the early days of the of the order, as it were, uh, these things were tightly coupled because the United States was dominant in these institutions and could use them strategically. It could use them to also mouth its values and could also use them as adjustment arenas. But as the United States has lost influence due to decolonization, lots of new members, due to changing politics and changing sometimes changing rules within these institutions. Uh, and in consequence, the United States is not getting what it, what it wants anymore so much. Uh, so the strategic value has declined, which of course means the United States has decamped and gone elsewhere. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that these other values have gone away, right? Or these other values aren't still there. Uh, what matters is now that they're, they're potentially working across purposes. And I think that's, you know, there's a way in which that's of the moment, right? Developing countries or third worldism or whatever you want to call it, the peak of the exercising of power, particularly in the General Assembly, of these kinds of actors. And this changes a lot 
with the collapse of the Cold War and the changing environment in the 1990s, although you still get that and you still get, for example, UNGA resolutions condemning Israel. That the United States. But nonetheless, I think that there's a similar story arguably going on today. And you could talk about the particularly the Trumpist critiques of multilateral institutions as a critique of the idea that they don't serve strategic interests anymore. Uh, and so we want to go bilateral, but rather than just still maintain them, the idea is that then just kind of destroy as much of their power as possible. Uh, uh -huh. um, ultimately, as we'll see, she takes a very realist position on all of this. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't have much truck for the idea that they're doing a lot of important symbolic work, again, when push comes to shove. Uh, and she also has some really interesting things to say about dynamism, which are also part of the adaptive side of it. But I do think that she you know, what happens in the 90s is interesting in light of this, right? And we should, I should go read what she has to say in the 90s, because in the 90s, you do get that reconvergence uh -huh. of, uh, of strategic, adaptive, and symbolic. Um, and maybe that bears out her argument, uh, or maybe uh, it demonstrates that, there, that she's right, less right here or more right elsewhere when she talks about the importance of dynamism. <laughs> And that that to the point she's going to pick up a little bit later on, which talks about the sort of status quo bias of regime analysis and how it really can slip into a defense of the existing order and a blindness to the ways in which that order is changing or being eroded, which we talked about a little bit last time with the end of Ruggie's piece, where he sees cause for hope in the way that change is being managed and says, oh, but the regime, the norms of the regime are still there. Uh, so if you position yourself with that as your, your vantage point, then sure, you can adduce evidence that demonstrates that these things are all sort of still going in the same direction. What strikes me about Strange's formulation here is that she seems completely untroubled in a way that would be kind of odd for certain kinds of American theorists, completely untroubled by the idea that something like an international organization has multiple different purposes and there is no master purpose that somehow controls all of them. So instead of the analysis that would say all international organizations are ultimately strategic bargains that have been uh, put together so as to lock in particular kinds of state power constellations, she's perfectly fine saying, yeah, some of them are and some of them aren't and sometimes they can be multiple things at the same time. So it's fascinating in light of the fact that she charges the regime concept as being woolly, right? Because it sort of means a bunch of different things to different people. She's perfectly comfortable with the idea that objects in the world are never pure types of particular theoretical or conceptual categories. So that's perfectly fine. Sure, here's an organization and it's got strategic aspects, but it's got adaptive aspects and symbolic aspects as well. And so it has all these things kind of mixed up together, which means you, if you start with that position, you can't do the kind of spare general theory that a lot of scholars who are more trying to do a kind of neo-positivist IVDV kind of calculation uh, would be more comfortable with and would say, oh no, well, she, well then this is obviously woolly because you can't nicely sort the case into one or another of these conceptual categories. Strange's whole point here seems to be, no, they're mixed. Like actual things are going in different kinds of directions and they're being used in, in different sorts of ways. So what I find fascinating about that is both sides of that dispute would in sense accuse the other of being woolly. It's just where the wooliness is located is different. Um, and uh, I, can, I can easily imagine sort of further rounds of that going on. But it just struck me that Strange is much more comfortable with the idea that now things are serving different kinds of purposes and we kind of have to track out and see what purposes they're serving at different points in time and that they can go in different directions and it shouldn't be surprising that they can go in different directions. So in fact, uh, when she does accuse, formally run through the argument for why they are wooly, she makes some, a series of claims that I think are not terribly controversial, that there is tension between the way regime, you know, regime is not used the same way. So she says, you know, when some people use regime, they seem to mean formal organizations. When some people say regime, they seem to mean what we would now talk about as kind of normative regimes, right? Or uh, what we think of as order, right? Uh, sort of convergent expectations. Uh, We're at the point, she says, almost, the concept of regime can be so broadened as to mean almost any fairly stable distribution of the power to influence outcomes. Uh, and she thinks that at that point, what, what is the concept doing for us? Uh -huh. So you uh -huh. said you wanted to say something about the, the notion of wooliness here. I don't think there's anything, I mean, there's, I don't think there's anything that shocking in these couple of this page, you know, no, she it, points out it's used inconsistently. 
and uh, ultimately becomes so broad in her view to be meaningless and you know fine i guess and and if you combine this point with the next point that she makes about the value bias of regimes then there's a way that the willingness because there is no single agreed upon definition then it allows it allows authors to use the concept of regime in various different kinds of ways. And one of the ways that they use it is to defend the existing order by talking about it as a regime. So that I, I think there's, there's a, there's an interesting kind of semantic, uh, semantic game that is, that is, uh, that is played there. But what's, what, what I find fascinating about the notion of it being woolly is it's, it seems like the main thing that she is concerned about here and it's, a, it's not at all the kind of positivist idea that if you just have clear enough definitions then you'll actually have truth. Instead, it's a much more modest, can we at least mean the same damn thing as, as, uh, as other people do when we are trying to use these things. Um, the charge though, which she repeats a number of times about the wooliness of the term um, is, is one that always kind of stuck with me. And I think part of the reason it did is because there's a way that after Strange, the notion of woolly or the notion of a vague definition for these things called international regimes gets wrapped up with something that Strange is not talking about, but Ruggie started touched on a little bit, which is the intersubjective quality of these sorts of common understandings. And so it's not that they're an intersubjective, it's not that an intersubjective understanding is woolly or vague, it's that it can't be grasped in some kind of incredibly delineated sharp way from the outside. You can only kind of figure out what it is by participating in the phenomenology of it or by engaging in the practice of it, the way the practice term people would talk about it. Uh, that, the two critiques kind of get run together. Like we don't know what you're talking about because you don't have a clear sharp definition of it. But then the rejoinder, no, it's intersubjective so it can't have a clear definition but that's not exactly the same axis of discussion as what Strange is talking about here. I think her critique is much more just on, on the level of academic use. Like people are using the term in weird and consistent ways. And then going into her next point, they're using it in weird and consistent ways that also allow them to do things like defend the status quo under the guise of simply analyzing the status quo. So let's talk about value bias. There are her arguments about value bias. There are kind of two things that struck me about this section. Uh, the first, which we talked a little bit about before we started, uh, is that there's something off here because she spends a lot of time talking about the concept of regime in international politics as, it's a, as if it's novel, as if this is a neologism. When in fact, the term regime, as you pointed out and other people have pointed out, is something that was used in international legal theory for a very long time. And I actually did the Google Scholar search where I did through like 1900 through 1980. And yeah, I mean, it's all over the place. You're right. So there's a way in which she, she treats this as kind of a new invention that doesn't make any sense. Yes. The second thing is, I don't know if you remember when we were going through the final stage review of the piece we published in International Studies Quarterly on you know, essentially paradigmism, Lakatosh, Kuhn, mm -hmm. and things like that. And we had that kind of two by two property space of Weberian ideal types where we said, you know, there are kind of two axes that of, of dispute that we call realism, liberalism, constructivism. One of them is the question of whether you can transcend power in international politics. In, you know, the liberal version of this is, can we build international organizations that make politics more rule-based, more like the adjudication of disputes of interest like Locke has in mind? Uh, or are we just kind of doomed to uh, real politic, power politics? And then we had this other uh, dimension, which was um, how socially constructed you think the world is. Right? Do you think that the you know international politics is more like natural necessity, uh, or do you think international politics is more uh, a kind of um, intersubjective product or whatever you want to think of linguistic discursive product. And, you know, the main argument there, which I, by the time we actually published that was sort of overdue was that you could be a constructivist or a constructionist and also think you couldn't escape power, which was blindingly obvious because that's where somebody like who's doing Foucauldian analysis would live, right? Or it's somebody where who's doing securitization theory would live, for example. Um, but here, but one of our reviewers said, you know, that they thought this was useful because it helped make sense of this thing in the English school. 
which is the way in which there's very, there are very strong, what we would think of in America as realist sensibilities in the English school. Uh, sensibilities about pessimism, about transformation. Uh, the notion of power politics is inevitable. Uh, a kind of focus on empires and suzerainties, and then balances of power as the mechanism for bringing about peace. Uh, and I remember, and we included that, I thought it was pretty interesting, right? The idea that, that English school theory had been imported ironically as a more kind of liberal constructivist view within IR, but that's not the sensibility of the English school. And man, this hit me like a ton of bricks reading this section. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Because it's bull, but it's, you know, not bullshit, but headly bull, right? <laughs> uh, and it's headly bull to argue that it's all about power man, Regimes are just a function of the distribution of power. And if you think otherwise, you're, you're just telling the story of the dominating over the dominated. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that was and, my reaction. And, and if we sort of loop that back to the discussion of Ruggy from last week, there is a way that like the perspective that Ruggy adopts in his article is very much the perspective of the embedded liberal order. And that perspective, if we take the sort of Headley Bull slash E.H. Carr kind of version of this, uh, where things that, things that pretend to be or present themselves as being simply universal claims are the way that power kind of hides itself, then you can say Ruggie's entire analysis, particularly his concluding analysis, locates itself on the side of the embedded liberal order, views things from the perspective of the embedded liberal order, and therefore, not surprisingly, sees evidence that the embedded liberal order is surviving fine. Whereas Strange's perspective from outside of that does not see that the embedded liberal order is doing fine, sees instead that yes, the sort of symbolic aspects are still there, but other aspects are moving and things are going in different kinds of ways. So in that sense, one could read, I think, Strange's criticism here as being not just about regimes, but as being a cautionary tale about accepting the terms of practical use that various actors have for how they describe a particular order that they're embedded in. A, a, a caution about adopting those things as your theoretical language for talking about those things. Because if you do that, yeah, you're buying into the idea that that way of construing the world is like actually valid and actually true. Yeah, I mean, this is realism, smaller realism is a kind of critical skepticism, right? Particularly a critical, skepti a critical skepticism of, what they call idealist plans, right? Um, mm -hmm. a, a way of uncovering the power relations that are really embedded in now in liberal order, but might have been embedded in other orders that claimed uh, Christian right or what have you. Um, that we can see easily when we're outside of those orders that this is all kind of power politics, but from the inside, maybe it's harder to detect. And I think, you know, she's right here about the value-ladenness of a lot of concepts in IPE. I was thinking here about um, how there's a lot of work, particularly in the 90s and early 2000s, in American IPE, which is so liberal it doesn't even call itself liberalism anymore. And if you look at some of that work, you can even see a kind of, a kind of cheering on, right? So we'll have work about how, under what conditions structural adjustment works. And running through it is a very strong kind of notion that structural adjustment, sh structural adjustment should work and is a good idea for us to explain how to make it work better through our article, which is a very value-laying kind of claim. So I, you know, I think that's still with us, but I also think because like you, I'm a Weberian, I think it's inevitable. And I don't think there's a, you, you will adopt a value proposition. The danger is when you claim that it isn't a value proposition. And Ruggie, to his credit, does not claim it's not a value proposition. He mm -hmm. does want to talk about the ways in which this is hierarchical and exploitative, um, even though he agrees with embedded liberalism, or right? even though he, he, he's a Polonyite, more or less, in, in that article, at least. So I thought this was a, a pretty well done thing, and it is, but it is, you know, it's very realist, right? I mean, it, it sounds a lot like Waltz talking about the end of the Cold War, where he says, well, the distribution of power hasn't changed, right? In the 70s, well, looking around, I don't know if the distribution of power is that different, 
So why do you think there's been a lot of change? We're saying, you know, there is no world army to maintain order. So what's the point of talking about regimes? Regimes are things you have domestically that mm -hmm. require enforcement. And by the way, they're things we usually call uh, domestic arrangements that we think are illegitimate. Right? We don't tend to talk about the uh, American domestic regime, we talk about, you know, the American democracy or the American state as opposed to baby duck Duvier, Duvier or some of the other 70s, Idi Amin, some of the other 70s uh, dictators she evokes. And those people we call regimes. Although now we do hear references to the Trump regime. So the that, Trump regime, I think that actually indicates something kind of interesting about about the those sort of value things. I mean, no, I, I think you're absolutely right about the, the way the where strange is going with this. Again, I got a very strong E.H. Carr vibe here. Yeah, yeah. So it's not it's not realism in the sense that only calculations of power and matter and everything else is epiphenomenal nonsense as much as the point of realism is to puncture the self-important pretensions of those theories that would forget that they are themselves a, a value-laden encoding of certain kinds of, of arrangements. And then that would presumably be followed by some later version, uh, which well, would this then have, is have where the same thing applied to it. This is what's really interesting about her argument, and I think it's why I'm drawn to it, and a lot of the people who I spend time with in IPE are drawn to her range of arguments. She does think it's about power, but she, you're right, there, she doesn't think it's necess necessarily about crude, rational choice or, or things that you can model with strategic rationality assumptions. In fact, one of her, as you pointed out at the outset, she thinks that a lot of what's happening in markets by the late 1970s is irrational. Right? It's not rooted in anything that we could, we could model using microeconomic assumptions, for example, of rationality. So that's one part of it. But she's also, um, she also wants us to, she also, and I think this is very clear from what we talked about when she talked about mistaking uh, the decision of the state to allow markets to acquire power and market actors to acquire power from the idea that hegemony is done, right? The Frankenstein's monster thing. She thinks that power is also rooted in a lot of other places. And so it's not that she doesn't think that outcomes in IP are a consequence of power, they're just not necessarily the consequence of just state power or just, or just the power of the market actors involved. But that's the kind of, so it's not the crude balance of power, realism, I'm using crude a lot. It's, the, it's not the high, highly simplified balance of power, realism, because she has a whole section about state centrism being bad, right? Instead, it's a, it's a very kind of realism all the way down position. Uh -huh. And you're right. Carr's notion that you can, con or even Ruggie, you can join social purpose to power in order to get outcomes. Uh, but yes, very much the puncturing, what, what, what Carr calls the Anglo-American morality, right? And the idea that, um, you know, what dominant states and dominant powers always do is they convince themselves that their values are indeed universal. They believe their own stories about the justification for their domination. And she's definitely all over that. That's a kind of more historicist, more woolly, if you will, realism. Uh, and one that uh, I think it's very interesting to see her tie so closely to English school scholars, um, given the way that these debates about the English school and realism play out in the United States, where that is definitely not emphasized. Even though Bazan wrote an entire book, which is basically just adding a variable to Waltz. Right, you know, uh, structural realism, we'll just add interaction capacity and then we can explain a lot of stuff. And then she says it's too, the other problem with regime theory is that it's too static. I right. think this is brilliant. It's one of the places where I just have written over and over again, why didn't you cite her more uh, <laughs> in my theoretical section on international order that, that Alex and I put together? Uh, I think, uh, you know, she basically just argues that, that that's, it's dynam dynamism all the time. There's constant bargaining, constant adjustment, and points out that Bretton Woods is not at all a stable entity. Mm -hmm. um, parts of the formal regime never get implemented, she, she points out, that um, it doesn't look the same month to month in some cases. And so the, to try to tease out what is the nature of the regime and try to code and pin down the properties of the regime necessarily makes you uh, doing, necessarily pushes you in the direction of static analysis and to neglect change. Um, and she then says, you know, that there are a lot of sources of change, particularly uh, technology. No, it's the, it has to do with the, the 
you have a set of market arrangements that are basically a function of certain technology and then technology disrupts those arrangements and the disruption of those arrangements, even though it shows up in bargaining patterns, doesn't come from bargaining patterns. It comes from the technological shocks that are then being kind of processed through those. I mean, it seems like the way she approaches this is what we call or what scholars in the volume call a regime is more of a contingent pattern that is actively produced rather than established and then sort of runs autonomously. So to the extent that there is a regime, it is the result of continual adjustments and continual tinkering to try to make the thing work in various ways. It is similar in some ways to the way that the way that Fritz Kratikwill in his most recent work talks about how international law works, that international law is not a set of static ideational beliefs that somehow tell you what to do, but that instead law is a kind of practical vocabulary that people use to work out particular issues. And if you think about a regime as a set of practical vocabularies that people are using to work out issues, then I think it's not incommensurate with the way Strange is, is talking about this. The difference would then be on whether the cultural vocabulary is worth focusing on by itself or whether you can kind of skip over that and just talk about things like material in the IR sense, material factors and how those impact things, which would then in terms of the matrix that we drew in that ISQ piece would put us into like the, the question of, of realism versus realist constructivism. Right. So how, how pliable do we think these things actually are? I mean, if, if we jump ahead to the end of the article where Strange makes that really strong argument about how uh, there are just that we don't need new theories. What we need is we, we the, the great truths about human society have all been discovered. She says, you know, what we need are constant reminders. So we do not forget them, which like sounds like Morgenthau. Right. It's that kind of like historicist historical pessimism. But the idea that that we already know this stuff. We already know that really what's important here are these kinds of material factors. And so how it works out, and it's kind of interesting detail, but not really what we should be focusing on. Whereas you could then read Ruggy and Craddockwill and others in that sort of style of constructivism as saying, no, no, actually how they work out matters, matters quite a lot because different kinds of vocabulary is going to allow you to do different sorts of things with these kinds of, of material inputs and material factors. So, but in that sense, some of the criticisms she have of, has of regimes are not entirely incommensurate with the way that at least the ruggy version of this argument grows up. Though they are, I think, more strongly, if we'd read the rest of the volume, it's more strongly in tension with, you know, the, uh, who else is in that volume? Miles Keller has a piece in there. I think there's a, um, there's the Krasner piece, there's Jervis has a piece in there. So there's other people who are sort of doing things that I think are a little bit more, um, a little bit more affected by this particular criticism. So, you know, there are actually kind of two reasons why you might wind up in that stability trap, for lack of a better world, right? One is uh, you would be focusing on equilibrium analysis. So, you know, again, borrowing from kind of microecon or economics more broadly, uh, the way in which we privilege um, how the, yeah, I say how the bargain works out right, rather than the process of bargaining. Um, the second reason you might do it is you might be importing, uh, you know, kind of neo-functional or functional systems arguments where, again, integrate normative integration is the the outcome, right? And it's interesting to me in what you were saying, because you kind of have, you kind of, whether it's in the regime literature or in the broader debates, you kind of have both going on, right? You have kind of two independent sources of uh, ideas that regimes are stable. One of them is the rational, the rationalist equilibrium trajectory. The other one is the regimes or catalogs of norms trajectory in which uh, you are, of course, trying to isolate the stable elements of those regimes as a methodological uh, and practical issue. I do want to say, though, that, that it is, it, there is a distinction between arguing that the world is made up of processes or is dynamic, right, that it's ontologically socially constructed, uh, and a question of plasticity or mutability. Right? So it's entirely possible to have things that are quite stable, that are built on dynamism, and under those circumstances, um, you wouldn't the problem wouldn't necessarily be that regimes uh, impute a, a stability. You, it would be an empirical question: Do regimes impute? Do you impute a stability of the regime that isn't there? Uh, and then it would be a methodological question: Are you building in that stability into the way that you study that regime? 
so a little bit a little bit different. Um, but, but I think but a, I think it's a, related, right? To the extent that once you've identified a normative core, then if you build that normative core into your theoretical apparatus, then you have uh, you have assigned a certain level of stability at the level of theory or analytical category to the way that you're trying to make sense of things, versus treating them as a sort of uh, continually flowing game, which a language game, which then would mean that you couldn't actually make that kind of assumption about stability. So I think they feed into each other. They're not exactly the same, I agree, but but I think they, they, they complement each other. And by the way, just for astute listeners, um, it was not Miles Kaler. That's not who I was thinking of. I was thinking of Arthur Stein. Um, In particular, she has this very, you know, she points out that it means you miss things about the way in which, ironically, it, it means that you attribute to a regime things that are exercises of state power, but not at the level of the centralized state. Mm -hmm. um, so the example of this, she says, is, is in a closely integrated world economic system, the same trend leads to the other aspect of reality that attention to regimes obscures, especially so when regimes are closely defined. In the volume by Young and others as being based on a group of actors standing in a characteristic relationship to each other. Uh, this, is the trend to the this is the trend to the transnational regulation of activities in one state by authorities in another. Uh, authorities that may be and often are state agencies such as the US Civil Aeronautics Authority, the Department of Justice, or the Food and Drug Administration. This is seldom any predictable pattern of interaction or awareness of contextual uh, limitations to be found in such regulation. Now, that's really interesting for two reasons. The first is that we have one of, I think, the more interesting productive research programs right now is around this kind of regulatory power and authority. And I've talked about that before. You know, we can think about uh, the, the hot thing right now, which is Abe Newman's, or Henry Farrell and Abe Newman's weaponized interdependence arguments. So that's, you know, this is a big deal. It's also a big deal, in my view, if, you're, if you care about questions about what's wrong with the way that Trump domestic policy interfaces with foreign policy because as I've argued in foreign policy with Abe that the, the, the long-term trend by Republicans now kind of metastasizing under uh, Trump to totally destroy U.S. regulatory agencies has actually removed a really important tool of American power mm -hmm. if you care about American power. Maybe that's good from your perspective. I mean, I'm supposed to be writing from the blob's perspective, so it's bad. We like American power. Uh, but um, value-laden. Uh, normative stuff, uh, but at a very time when we have other actors who are now stepping up their capacities to do so. The European Union for quite some time, because of the size of its market, has had this kind of authority. Uh, and now uh, China in particular has this kind of extraterritorial reach and to the point of things that might seem trivial, but are, in a, are an example of this, like getting various uh, businesses and sports organizations to uh, condemn or apologize for messages that are critical of the Communist Party and its activities, particularly right now in, in Xinjiang or in Tibet. So mm -hmm. they've been able to use this extraterritorial authority to chill speech, for example. Well, and the thing, the thing that this passage specifically reminded me of, actually, is the sort of argument that I've seen, I know you've seen as well, that part of the global response to COVID-19 at least in the early stages, was slowed by the fact that lots of agencies around the world were waiting for the CDC in the United States to make sets of determinations because their standard operating procedures were to use the authority of the CDC as a way of benchmarking their own kinds of responses. And the CDC was not used and did not make those things and arguably was sort of politically hamstrung with being able to do this. Now, if we take Strange's argument seriously, then that then Strange's argument shows that once again, you know, it's it's the power of Frankenstein allowing the monster to do the various things that it did. But again, it struck me as exactly an example of this kind of non-state but still state-linked authority that is quote unquote domestic, but is really international authority. Lots of agencies, public health agencies around the world use the CDC as a way of coordinating their own activities. So. Yeah, we, we've really seen the collapse of this in the last three years, and it's not all due to Trump, right? We have a long history of deregulation and of neutering agencies and of corporate capture of regulatory agencies, but in, the Democrats have been complicit in this, particularly in the financial arena, but overall it's really a the 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 sort of attempt to drive out expertise is a Republican program. And the problem there is that the that expert authority was 
part of the reason why the United States was able to set standards in these arenas, because you would say, you know, the FDA, they really know what they're doing, uh, or the, uh, the Federal Transportation Administration really knows what it's doing. Uh, and so they have the best standards, those practices. Often we taught other agencies, right? The Ameri American agencies taught other agencies, helped stand them up, help disseminate best practices. Uh, and, and we've just seen a systematic failure along those lines. So the CDC is hamstrung, so you can't look to the CDC anymore. The U.S., the whole, the whole system depended upon the idea that the U.S. was embedded with China, right? And we shut down that embedding. So that, that was a way, you know, so, so we lost that, that kind of, um, all the mechanisms that everybody assumed in place weren't there. And then the U.S. went just, and then on the policy side, right, the U.S. goes AWOL in terms of coordinating uh, epidemic, you know, responses to the epidemic. I mean, right. just doing things like even stopping a G7 resolution because it doesn't fit the political, immediate political purposes of the Trump administration. But you also see this effect in things like the, you know, uh, Sharpie gate. Mm -hmm. Right. The fact that the president writes, you know, changes the trajectory of the storm to include or changes the, the storm, the, the storm area to include what was it, Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, so he isn't looking like he's, in, you know, he's wrong. Uh, and then the, the NOAA actually backs him. Right. The, the leadership of NOAA backs him whether because they're political hacks or whether because they're terrified of the hammer coming down on their agency. This stuff has been extremely damaging. What was super damaging, of course, which I think is not a problem that started with Trump at all, was the, the, the 737 MAX. It's the 737 or 747? 737. Yeah. Uh, was the unwillingness to take that offline. And in right. fact, other regulatory agencies in China and Europe took the lead on that. And that was just really, I think, extremely destructive. I don't mean to go on on this, but it is also, I think, testament to the way in which she's right. There is this really interesting dynamic and complex relationship between state power and the power of the state as a kind of leviathan, right? A decision makers at the top of the state, but also these agencies within the state that often have a great deal of autonomy. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, and other kinds of actors out there. And one of her big contributions to the field is to say that it goes all the way back to the stuff we were talking about at the beginning. It's to say, look, the fact that the state may be voluntarily conceding power does not make the state weak. And, 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 and to put that in the context of the discussion of regimes in particular, I think Strange is absolutely correct. Analyzing what's going on in these terms, in, in, these, in these cases we've been talking about, from the perspective of the international regime for pandemic response, wouldn't really illuminate very much about what was going on. We get much further if we disaggregate that regime regime into a series of different kinds of arrangements and relations and follow those things out and look at how particular kinds of, of domestic political moves in one part of the United States that delegitimate expertise or have a certain kind of a ripple effect here that sort of move out on different lines and, and, and create the, these different sorts of effects, that it's much more complicated, that using a notion like regime makes it really hard because a notion like regime, then we would have to ask a question like, has the regime for pandemic response been strengthened or decayed? I'm not even sure how you go about answering that question because that, that's not really the right question in a lot of ways. So the regime notion really directs us in a, a very different way that, that obscures perhaps uh, the more insightful kinds of comments we could make. Who have you been joined by, by the way, here? This is Kibbeth. Oh, hello, She's Kibbeth. one of our four cats. She's the only one who's not orange. Uh, <laughs> she is very much, uh, she's very friendly, but she is particularly into me. She's the cat. You know, we all, some of us have these cats, like we close the door on them and they, they complain in her case, if I close the door on her, say I want to go to the bathroom, she'll complain very loudly. Sometimes she'll go to Maya and she'll mm -hmm. start telling Maya that she's yeah. upset about it. And this is not actually all that different than Ruggie because Ruggie's sources of regime consolidation and regime change tend to come from, granted, an ideational or conceptual realm that Strange wouldn't necessarily point to, but they're not coming from state dictates. And they're not coming from formal state agencies per se. They're coming from a variety of other places that are then passing through state agencies and state bargains and so on and so forth. So I really think that, uh, that, that, that in some ways Strange's target here 
is more with Steve Krasner's articulation of what the regime research program is supposed to be about. And that research program really doesn't go anywhere. Research on regimes goes in very different kinds of directions. I remember I remember sitting in, in Bob Jervis's seminar at Columbia, and we had this discussion about so what happened to regime theory after we had read parts of this, uh, of this volume. And, and, and Bob said, oh, well, that's easy. Um, a number of these people uh, moved, to, moved on to epistemic communities, and then they moved on to constructivism. And, and I think he's a little oversimplified, but I think he's making a, a useful point there, which is some of the sensibility here, there can be what we would call liberal in the not everything reduces to power politics sense, that that kind of sensibility, you can see that in some of the regime's work. And then as that sort of goes away, then people are like, oh no, we're gonna do this in epistemic communities and early epistemic communities work is all about this too. And then early constructivism is kind of all about this too. Like, no, no, there can be norms and ideas that are not reducible to power politics. And there are ways that you can have a, a, a solution that isn't purely about power. So that kind of sensibility sort of continues. I think in some ways that sensibility is a target here. And Ruggy is partially immune to that because I think the directionality of where Ruggy wants to go with this is a little bit more, um, a little bit more complex and less ideational determinist than some of that kind of more idealist work tends to get into. So there's an interesting debate here between her and Ruggie. And I will have to remember the next time I assign the Ruggie piece that I definitely want to assign this piece as well. Mm. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's been fun. It has. So we and will, we, we'll, we'll figure out what we're going to do next and we'll announce yeah, we'll, that we'll, once we you know, We'll it announce out. it on the Twitter account and we'll announce it on facebook and yeah all, all the the usual social media channels all right well bye everyone and thanks for watching all right or listening yes. see you all next time mm -hmm.